evening, everyone. Welcome once again to The Conversation. We come together this time to talk about change makers, and that seems fitting considering we are celebrating the 95th birthday of Martin Luther King Jr. this weekend, but when we think about the conversation of this show, what a road it's been on in the last four years. When you think back to when this started in 2020, the state of our community, the state of the world at that point, there was so much going on. So it really seems fitting to start the year off. And like you mentioned, during the week of Martin Luther King Jr., really honoring and recognizing the work that he did to talk about change makers, people who are pushing for positive changes here in our community. Absolutely. Those are changes that we've talked about, whether it's in education or in health or in economic sustainability, whatever it might be. Then, boy, when you think of organizations that have been advocating for changes regarding racial inequality, Maybe at the top of the list is the NAACP. They, for more than a century, have been fighting for the advancement of black people. And that includes the longtime president of the Columbus branch, Nana Watson. It gets tired, but you know what? You got to keep on pushing. You just can't let it consume you. We get tired and we go to sleep, wake up, and it's the same old fight. And that's okay. It was February 12th, 1909. The National Association for the Advancement of Colored People was born. Then the NAACP aimed to secure for all people the rights guaranteed in the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. Now, 115 years later, that same spirit of striving for equality remains, including right here in Central Ohio. Advocating for black people is in my DNA, and I wouldn't change my DNA for anything in this world. I love black people, and I, I relish and I'm, I'm appreciative that I had the opportunity to lead the oldest civil rights organization in America. Nana Watson is the president of the Columbus branch of the NAACP, which was founded in 1915. In the more than 100 years since, the group has had a vision to ensure a society in which all individuals have equal rights and that there is no racial hatred or racial discrimination. So whatever issues are taking place in our community and we believe that it's unfair to black people, you can rest assured we're going to knock on your door and say, how can we help you? We want to be a part of the solution and not the problem. And we want to affect change in policies that affect black people. And that's what we've been doing, I believe. This is Watson's third term as president for the Columbus branch. And through the years, she has seen plenty of change, much of it positive, but the fight continues in many respects. We are fighting in 2024 the same challenges that Dr. King did, only at a higher level. So things have not changed. Racism still exists. And we're going to continue to carry that baton to fight racism and injustice. And when we talk about did, what did our community learn after the murder of George Floyd, I tell you what they learned. They decided we need diversity and inclusion. So every corporation, oh, we got a DNI person. What are those DNI per people doing? Are they being honest? How did they get there? Did their corporation just say, hey, Matt, I think you would be good at DNI? You know, what changes have they made in their corporation that will trickle down to our community? That's the question. To that end, the NAACP Columbus has focused in on issues that matter most to the people they serve. Education, economic sustainability, getting out the vote, and social injustice. Among the examples of their advocacy getting results, the recently created Citizens Review Board after a number of police-involved shootings in the city. We're extremely proud of, we demanded a Citizens Review Board and that went on the ballot and it passed. It is because the NAACP and our demands that we needed this. And now we have a Citizen Review Board. It took a minute, but we continue to push until it came into existence. That doesn't mean that uh, we're anti-police. We certainly are not, but we need to monitor the Columbus Police Department as we did. We have a new chief of police, we're proud of that, but we needed an entity that individuals could go to and say, I've got a complaint. It's that spirit of being a voice for the voiceless that keeps Watson and her executive committee motivated. But reaching and teaching the young people about their history is also important. It is that young people, we sometimes we don't always give them credit, 
But I think if you give them just a little bit, they'll take that and run. They are where they are because of the NAACP, that we fought for them to get where they are. We fought for young people to have these jobs in corporate America, whether they appreciate it or not. And it's my hope that when black people are in a corporation and they have key positions, the expectation is that they speak up against racism because it has not ended. In the past few years, NAACP chapters have been created in Central Ohio high schools and colleges, all with the same mission of achieving equality and eliminating racial discrimination. For Watson, the job is never done, but every fight won is worth the battle scars that come with it. One of the members of the NAACP tells me all the time, well, you'd rather go to the NAACP before the NAACP has to send for you, because if we send for you, that's not going to be a good thing. Our advocacy in trying to collaborate has proven that it can be done. You just got to keep pushing, keep pushing. It's got to be the thorn in somebody's side. And sometimes we are the thorn. It takes time commitment and you have to have a commitment. And I want young people to come and take this baton and just continue our work. So when I'm laid to rest, I can say, okay, they got it. And I can just go on to sleep. <laughs> I rest in peace. And Nana Watson, she is so passionate about this, yeah. as she should be. And yeah. what I love, too, is her passion to get the young people involved. They have mm. a program called Youth Works where they're learning as well how to find those, those game-changing things that need to be fixed in our community yeah. and around the nation that the NAACP has uh, asked them to do. Yeah. And they have about 18 to 20 students right now and young people that are getting involved in that. And we know how important that is. It is so important to train up that next yeah. generation, right? Because you can only really make change if you continue to make that push. As Nana mentioned, this is something that has been a long time coming. We talk about Martin Luther King Jr., the work that he's done, the work that the NAACP has done, and that's continued over so many years. So you have to make sure that you have those people behind you that will continue to carry on that torch, carry that baton, as she said, and really continue that fight. And that's what he wanted. He talks about that. We always talk about that I have a dream speech, yeah. right? And that dream that we're all trying to fulfill. We're still trying to fulfill it. We are. It, it, it's not stopped just because, you know, we've had 60 years of progress. There's yeah. a lot of progress still to be made. And that's where I think the NAACP is really making it a point to keep fighting. There's yeah. always something to fight for, as we know. Absolutely. And we talk about how much the times have changed, how you have to adapt with your circumstances, with what's happening in the community, in the state, in the world. And I think that they see that. They recognize that. Even talking about the Civilian Review Board yep. when it comes to Columbus Police, what's happening in our community. And making sure that they are that voice to let officers know this is what's happening. This is what is concerning our community. And we are the ones who can say this is what needs to happen. Yeah, if you're passionate about making change in the black community, NAAC is where you need to reach out. And we'll have more information for you there. And you may have noticed that interview was set in a church. That's where the NAACP has their meetings. So much of the NAACP has roots in the church. And for years, we've seen families torn apart by violence and many other awful things. And it's the church many times where people tend to turn to for support and to inspire change. Pastor Gerald Murphy, for example, has dedicated his life to making an impact in our community. And he tells our Jordan Dunlap, it all begins with really being the change you want to see in the world. There has to be a willingness to meet people um, where they are to really see change. During the summer of 2020, we saw police brutality, protest, and violence around America. Then we all had to navigate the isolation that came with the COVID-19 pandemic. Although the church is often looked at as a place of hope during moments of despair, Pastor Gerald Murphy says that that's not all the church is. He says that through intentional fellowship, prayer, and commitment to others that lives will be changed. Pastor Gerald says the church has an important proactive role to play in fighting violence. He tells me the true change moves at the speed of relationship. Community impact really has to do with relationships. It's having a relationship with the community that you're wanting to serve, that you're wanting to support, um, that you're wanting to make a difference in. Although violence still occurs throughout the city just like anywhere else, organizations like the Columbus Dream Center, Garden City Church, and Reset have programs to help meet practical needs of people and their kids, offering them meals, job resources, and after-school programs with the intent of fostering relationships. When it comes to how the church can better support the community, Pastor Gerald says it will require going the extra mile to serve people, and this really became evident during the pandemic. What I saw over those years was just a willingness to come together. Uh, churches, black churches, white churches, urban churches, suburban churches, coming together, opening up their doors. Um, I think the biggest thing is really meeting them where they are. 
And as I look over the landscape of you know, Columbus, I think about nonprofits like the Columbus Dream Center, where I've had the privilege to serve now for, for almost six years. Um, I think about other ministries uh, that are really intentional about going to uh, the students, going to the youth. So Pastor Gerald also told me that it's really important for the Church of Columbus specifically to be well informed, but also connected to things that are happening throughout the city. Yeah, and we've seen that over the last several years with the pandemic, the violence, especially starting in early 2020, that the church has had to find ways to adapt and to meet people right where they are in the communities that they're in and not make them feel ashamed yeah. of, you know, or not make them feel like they don't belong, right? Yeah, and I think it's too like a different level of outreach, again, like not just being the four walls of the church, but actually going to people's houses, mm -hmm. uh, having lunches with them and just doing more intentional things uh, that truly do matter. So yeah, I love that. The churches have always been great about reaching people. But again, when you are stuck with these constraints that we've had with the pandemic and now lately, just making sure that you're reaching people because they're not walking into the church all the time. Yeah. Sadly, we know it's down a little bit, yeah. but you're finding ways to get to them. Yeah. So he made a good point in saying that. Thank you so much Jordan, for bringing that Thanks, to our guys. attention. Yeah. And from the church to a central Ohio woman who is looking to improve birth outcomes for a specific population and that population is black women, a sector of our community that has historically seen birth-related deaths and complications significantly higher than their white counterparts. But through education and the use of a health advocate known as a doula, Sierra Johnson introduces us to this change maker who is hoping to save lives one mother at a time. And I always tell people, I, I used to teach clinicals for nursing schools, and um, I told my nursing students, nursing, you don't choose nursing, nursing chooses you. So nursing chose me. From an early age, Jatu Boykai knew exactly what she wanted to do. While in nursing school, a life-changing trip to Liberia would solidify how and where she wanted to use her nursing know-how. They told me to throw on some gloves and help, and I did. <laughs> Um, ended up within the two weeks that I was there, I delivered seven babies. Um, I was able to donate a lot of uh, medical supplies. I was able to see, you know, the way that they conduct surgeries is very different from how it's done in the United States. With her passion and newfound direction, Jatu dove headfirst into the fast-paced and emotionally charged world of labor and delivery. But she says it didn't take long for her to make some disheartening observations. There's implicit bias. There is... Um, flat out just m mistreatment of black women. I've seen it. That implicit bias is a topic that researchers and health organizations have spent years working to understand. Dozens of papers have focused on how these bias impact patient care and health outcomes. According to the Center for Disease Control, black women are three times more likely to die from a pregnancy related cause than white women. The research continues by explaining multiple factors contribute to these disparities, such as variation in quality health care, underlying chronic conditions, structural racism, and implicit bias. And I had my three babies back to back, and thankfully I had really healthy pregnancies, I had beautiful deliveries, I had beautiful um, labors, but I know that not everybody has had that experience, and I've seen that as a nurse. I've seen black women um, go through some horrific experiences in labor and delivery, and um, so yeah, it's just, it's one of those things where you know too much sometimes as a, as a nurse, um, and especially as a black nurse. She tells us she wanted to be part of the solution. Enter Moby Nurses, Inc., an organization started by Jatu that serves a perinatal support for minority communities. This program has a focus on doulas in introducing the concept to those most at risk for adverse birth outcomes. So when it, when it comes to birth work, a doula is a birth coach. A doula is somebody who is going to ensure that you are comfortable, ensure that you are listened to, ensure that you are, that you get everything that you need from your birth experience, whatever you want your birth experience to look like. Moby Nurses with an emphasis on OB is a two-part project. 
One, education, letting women know what doulas are and how they can help and how crucial advocates are for a mama's pregnancy. So, you know, you engage with your doula throughout your pregnancy. Um, she attends your birth and helps support you through that. And then she continues that support through the postpartum period. The second aspect is making those doulas available, a service that is often considered a luxury with a starting price tag of $2,000. Moby Nurses is working to make this service accessible to the women most at risk, free of charge. A small step here in central Ohio to make a difference one birth at a time. That doula is there to make sure that that happens. When it comes to black women specifically and women of color, a doula is an advocate. That is what, that is what black women need in the birthing space. Um, we have seen that doulas decrease labor times they decrease the rates of C-sections, they decrease overall complications, um, and increase overall positive outcomes for, for moms and babies. So the big takeaway is really just having that advocate in the hospital for you, kind of uh, facilitating for what you want your birthing plan to be and making sure that you follow through and that you have those positive birth outcomes. And it's incredible that this, this story is actually so timely because I have a friend who just went recently through the birth of her second child and she had a doula for this pregnancy, she did not for the first, and she shared how different her experiences were and how she felt that she really got what she wanted and that she was being heard the second time around versus when she didn't have that advocate for her. And then educating folks on what a doula even is yeah. and then facilitating it free of cost is really a game changer. If you can take away that barrier, you're really just upping the chances of just having a better birthing experience. And a better birthing experience is better outcomes for yes. everyone involved, as yes, you mentioned yes. too. So that's what we like to see. Yes. And again, that change that we're hoping will kind of catch on a little bit. Hopefully. And maybe hopefully. become a little more She's popular. starting local and hopefully she can build out from yeah. here. Incredible. Start, All right, mm -hmm. Sierra, thank you. And of course, as we continue our conversation about change makers in Central Ohio, it only makes sense to shine a light on an organization, a program here that serves as a catalyst for change. Black Girl Rising Incorporated uses research to improve outcomes specifically for African American girls, turning their traumas into testimonies and reminding them of their resilience. I have an undergraduate degree in special education, uh, a minor in curriculum development, and I have a master's in learning disabilities and behavioral disorders. I had spent probably 20 years looking at black girl aggression in schools. So I was traveling around the country um, trying to figure out what was making our girls so angry. That kind of insight and experience is why Fran Frazier was invited by Dr. Laura Belliston Cobb and the State Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services to take a closer look at mental health in the black community and the stigmas around it. Frazier, though, had something else in mind. I got them to change their minds so that we could look at what was happening to black girls. Our girl stories hardly ever get told. And when they are told, it's always in a, a deficit manner. But our girls are also resilient in lots of wonderful ways. And we need to figure out how do we create more of that. They started with research in 2010, surveying more than 400 girls in four Ohio cities. Primarily because black girls seem to be more significantly exposed to trauma than any other group of girls or boys. And we wanted to know exactly what were some of the bigger things that our girls are dealing with. And then how do we begin to build resiliency around that? But as the group worked to find answers to those questions, a former lawmaker posed another. It was uh, former Senator Charlita Tavares who came to me and said, so now what are we going to do? What they did led to the creation of Black Girl Rising Incorporated. We did focus groups, we do a lot of listening sessions, we did the survey research. Speaking directly to and hearing from the black girls experiencing that trauma. They are using their voice in multiple ways to tell us what is um, great in their lives, to tell us what they're struggling with, to tell us what they think about. Then encouraging those same girls to turn data collection into action. Looking at what they said and how they felt 
and decided to create programming around that. We started a black girl think tank. A safe space for girls in the program to openly and without judgment voice their concerns, communicate across barriers, and build a community. We do more facilitating than teaching. We don't give advice, we don't tell them what to do, but we know how to listen. So even after our research, we continue to find out from girls what do you think are the most important things that black girls are dealing with right now? So our think tank said safety and not knowing your history. Because they feel like if you know your history, you know your roots, you celebrate your culture, you might be a little bit more caring and compassionate to other girls who look like you. But it's not all talk and no walk. The girls in the program take the data, dialogue, then develop problem-solving solutions. We're gonna have a Black Girl Summit soon where they have to present their papers, present their research, say what they wanna do about these issues, and then uh, recruit girls to help them in these projects. Using that as fuel for policy changes. Those papers that the girls are working on won't just be presented to other girls. They're going to be presented to city council. They're going to be presented to leaders in the city of Columbus so that change can happen on a larger scale and so that we can build community engagement and increase advocacy. We know that our girls have the ability to really create the kind of communities that they really want if they get permission to use their voice. So they, just like Sister Laura said, they're creating the change and we're giving them the tools to be able to do that. To hear from the girls themselves, to say this is what we want to see change in our community, it's, it's incredible because they're not just saying, here's what you need to do to fix it. They're asking the girls, what can we do yeah. to help you and to make change here locally? And you know, I hate hearing all the time that you know, black girls feel like they don't have a voice. Black women sometimes feel like they don't have a voice. Yeah. It's getting muted and organizations like this yeah. that give them a voice, give them some self-assurance that yes. I am important, I am powerful, I have everything I need, and the world just needs to recognize that I can be that person. Absolutely, and that's what that was what Sister Fran was saying, is we give them the tools. Mm -hmm. They have the voice, they have the opinions, mm -hmm. we're just allowing them, we're facilitating so that they can use that voice. And it was really cool, too, for the girls to really kind of, as an incentive, stay in this program for at least six months. They are inducted into this Black Girl think tank with a string of pearls and the way that sister fan explained it to me is that pearls are a symbol of resilience that oysters create pearls because they're trying to heal when they're thrown around when they're agitated or there's an irritation or something amiss and over time as they heal themselves they form these pearls and that led to a really cool moment between sister fran and myself you are formally a member of Black Girl Think Tank. Oh my goodness, thank you so much. Oh, that is wonderful, thank you. You made a lot of pearls with your life to get where you are, I know you did. So as you can imagine, that was an emotional <laughs> yeah. uh, moment for me, but in, in such an incredible way when she said, you've created a lot of pearls with your life. And that really helped me to change my way of thinking as well, that there's been a lot of trauma, there's been a lot of tragedy, but I've been able to create a lot of beautiful things from that. And so I keep those pearls close to me, they're on my desk right now, <laughs> and just serve as that reminder when you're having those moments where you don't feel like you're doing what you should be doing, or you don't feel like you're enough. She tells those girls, wear those pearls with your blue jeans, wear them wherever you may be. And if you have those moments, just give them a touch and remind yourself that you are resilient, you're an overcomer, and you have everything you need to get yeah. to that next level. What a special woman, what a it special awesome. organization. It, it really Oh my is. gosh, that is fantastic. Yeah. You know, as we try to bring it back to this whole theme of change makers, yeah. and we think about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and how, how amazing he was in his okay. life and his legacy still lives on. Uh, we thought we'd want to hear some words from him as we celebrate again, what would have been his 95th birthday on Monday. Uh, I'm sure that many people in the white community have now resigned themselves to the fact that 
The Negro movement is an unstoppable movement that our aims and our aspirations are right and just. I'm very happy to be able to announce that we have come today to the climax of the long struggle for justice, freedom, and human dignity in the city of Birmingham. I say the climax and not the end, for though we have come a long way, that is still a strenuous path before us, and some of it is yet uncharted. But somewhere I read of the freedom of assembly, somewhere I read of the freedom of speech, somewhere I read of the freedom of press, somewhere I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest far right. The words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and you hear those words from back in the 1960s and how much they still resonate today. Yeah. There are people still fighting for what they believe in um, and for rights that still have not come completely for so many black people in this country. And that's why he said we've reached a climax, but mm -hmm. we're not at the end. Yeah. But it is, I love that he said an unstoppable movement, yeah. right? And we see that, we see that continued progress in terms of people who continue to join that movement. And we're not, you know, making our voices heard just because we can, but because like he said, it is right and it is just. Uh, you know, people of color deserve as much as anybody else, um, no matter their race, no matter their creed, no matter their religion, no matter where they come from in terms of socioeconomics. If you're a human being, you deserve to have as much as any other human being. I think about the words that John Lewis used to always say, good trouble, right? Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you have to make your voice heard. You have to raise a little bit of, you yeah. know what, to, <laughs> to get change to happen. And we see so many organizations that are doing that, but also making sure that black people, even when they are beaten down, find a way to yeah. bring that confidence back up yeah. so that you know you are worth something. That resilience. Um, yeah. So yeah. Um, Dr. King's words still, still resonate right now. I get yeah. chills every time I hear I know. him I'm sitting here say thinking. anything. Um, <laughs> it's incredible. Yeah. You understand why so many people joined his cause. Mm -hmm. He was such a passionate speaker, but he had a reason to be passionate. He was fighting for something that we continue to fight for today. And I like to think that, you know, the conversation mm -hmm. is a little, a little piece of that, that we're trying mm -hmm. to do our part to carry on his legacy. And this is not the end. It's definitely is, not the end. But it is an unstoppable movement. 100%. Sure. Thank you so much for joining us on this Ladies edition of the conversation, we leave you with Dr. King. My poor little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today.